So remember back from our gas laws, we have a sealed container. We're gonna close this valve so it's all sealed off. Now there's a certain amount of molecules bouncing around. In this case, there's 14.7 PSI of molecules bouncing around. This shows zero PSI gauge because 14.7 on the inside, 14.7 on the outside, there's a zero PSI difference. But really this zero PSI G should be 14.7 PSI A approximately. So we're going to increase the volume of this container. With those same number of molecules having a larger space, we'll end up with less pressure. So we'll watch the pressure gauge as we increase the volume. And we see that as we increase the volume, the pressure starts to drop. Now, if I open this valve, the higher pressure from the atmosphere goes inside and replaces the pressure in that cylinder. So now we have equilibrium. That's very important for us to understand. That same thing is gonna also apply here with this container. So as the balloon has elasticity and it wants to stay deflated, but there's still 14.7 PSI on the inside as there is 14.7 PSI on the outside because of this hole in here. So what I'm gonna do is force air inside the balloon. The balloon's going to expand, but as the balloon expands, we have to do something with the volume inside of here. So it's gonna escape through this little hole and I've just taped a little piece of paper on the end so we can see that movement happen. So we can see as I inflate the balloon, the volume of air inside is pushed out. And then when I release it, the elasticity of the balloon starts to come back and that volume comes in to replace it. This paper movement is very similar to how a valve works in an AC compressor. What we're gonna do next though is we're gonna inflate this and we're gonna seal this chamber up. Now that I've sealed this chamber up, we have a pressure equilibrium. There's pressure 14.7 inside the balloon. As the balloon tried to contract, it started to increase the volume, which means the pressure started to drop. So eventually we come to a pressure equilibrium with also taking account the elasticity of the balloon. So really we could think about a vacuum as keeping the balloon open, or really it's atmospheric pressure and pressure difference keeping the balloon inflated. Now, if I release the plug on this side, atmospheric pressure will flow back in on the other side. The elasticity of the balloon will go back to how it's happy and it will push the remaining air at the top. So here we go. And that's simply atmospheric pressure or what we call a vacuum working together. Now let's take another look at that same scenario. So we take a look at our syringe. This works very similar to a piston. As the volume of this cylinder increases, the pressure decreases, but it's open on the side. So the atmospheric pressure replaces all the pressure difference. So as we go back the other way, we're decreasing the volume, so the pressure increases, and we push the gas back out. This is also very similar to how an engine works. On an engine, the piston starts to come down like this, and the volume increases, so the pressure decreases. It's the atmospheric pressure that starts to replace that. And that's how an engine is able to pull the air in for it to operate. On an engine, you also add things like turbos and superchargers that actually force the air back in instead of relying on just atmospheric pressure. But that's simply how it's working. It's the pressure difference. On a car, when you have the vacuum system, it's all from that piston going down, increase in volume, decrease in pressure. The atmospheric pressure comes in and replaces it. Now in that same process, if I try to hold my finger on the end of this and try to pull it back, it's very, very difficult because I'm trying to overcome all that pressure difference. As I try to increase the volume, pressure drops, and the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is keeping the cylinder closed. So it's very difficult to overcome that 14.7 every single square inch. If I take my finger loose, it very easily opens and closes. Now let's take a look at that a little bit farther. So in that same process, let's think about our day-to-day -day lives. We have fluid that we're going to be drinking. And what we do is we typically use a straw. But also imagine that we have this cylinder right here. This cylinder really represents your mouth. So we have the straw that's dipped inside the fluid. So in your mouth, you literally make the volume of your mouth larger, which causes a pressure decrease. So here we go. We're going to simulate that aspect right now. And we can see that the fluid fills up the cylinder, just like it would be with your mouth. The difference is we're not really pulling this up in here. It's actually the atmospheric pressure pushing it up. Remember as this volume increased, the pressure decreased. So it's actually the atmospheric pressure pushing down on this fluid. That atmospheric pressure pushing down on the fluid pushes the fluid up inside of the straw and inside of the syringe, or in this case, it would be your mouth. So it's a difference in atmospheric pressure that's making that fluid move. And then if we decrease the volume, we're actually able to push it back into the container. So that's how we're working. The straw is really just simply 
part of vacuum, part of what we do in our everyday life, using that atmospheric pressure to push the fluid up into that straw. And then if we release, it just naturally, gravity is gonna allow it to flow back into that container. So vacuum and atmospheric pressure is part of our day-to-day -day lives. But let's look at something else that also plays a part in that. If you've ever been washing dishes and you've taken a glass completely and submerged it inside of the fluid, and then you try to pull it back up, if you notice the fluid comes up inside of the glass and you're able to defy gravity by pulling it up. But again, this is still atmospheric pressure. The atmospheric pressure pushing down on the fluid is actually keeping the fluid pushed up inside of this container. As the weight of the water tries to pull down, it actually creates a pressure difference inside of the top part of this. So that pressure difference causes a pressure to drop. The atmospheric pressure is greater than that, so it keeps it pushed up. Now, once I pull this up higher than the level of the fluid, atmospheric pressure can then go underneath, replace it without the resistance of the water, and we're back to equilibrium. So it all has to do with vacuum and atmospheric pressure. Let's take a look at that a little bit farther. But at what point would we not be able to pull it up any farther? Well, once upon a time, they used to think that a vacuum was a force. It wasn't until they did studies and did experiments, they found out that vacuum wasn't a force. It was just atmospheric pressure, but they didn't know that once upon a time. What they did find was they could only pull water up so far. No matter how hard they tried, no matter how powerful of a pump they had, they could only move water a certain distance. The first to come up with this were the plumbers, and they found out that no matter how hard they tried with the vacuum, they could only pull water up 33.9 feet. That the best pumps, most powerful pumps in the world, they could only pull the water up 33.9 feet. I find that absolutely fascinating. And they found out that that wasn't always a set standard. When they went higher in the altitude, such as in mountains, they could pull water up a lower distance because there's less atmospheric pressure. But when they did studies, they finally got to realize that the weight of the water at 33.4 feet was equal to the weight of the atmospheric pressure. And if we had less atmospheric pressure, we could pull water up less feet. So we actually use water to measure vacuum. In other words, 33.4 feet of water at atmospheric level was what we call a perfect vacuum. That was the maximum amount we could pull water up. If we wanted to measure vacuum, we'd have to carry around a column of water 33.9 feet tall. And at the top side of that, that's where we'd hook our vacuum up to it. And we could see if we pulled a perfect vacuum, 33.9 feet, that water would pull up the entire distance, 33.9 feet. Now it's very difficult for us to carry around a column of water 33.9 feet tall. So they had to use something a little bit smaller to measure vacuum. And that came to the use of mercury. Mercury, which I don't have with me, mercury is much, much heavier than water. So instead of using a column of water 33.9 feet tall, we could use mercury, a much, much heavier liquid. So mercury at only 29.92 inches was the same as water at 33.9 inches. So if we had a tube of mercury and we had a perfect vacuum, and so on this end we're pulling a perfect vacuum, we could lift that mercury a maximum of 29.92 inches. So that was a method for us to measure vacuum using mercury. They're also able to use mercury for barometers to measure air pressure. So in other words, they had a tub of mercury like this. They had mercury in the bottom with a distance in inches on the top side. And as the atmospheric pressure pushing down into mercury changed from day to day or weather conditions, it would change how far the mercury was pushed inside of the tube. So that's how a barometer started. Because mercury is a whole lot heavier than water, it was easier to have that instrumentation. However, mercury can be very poisonous and dangerous to work with, so we eventually did away with mercury and started using other instruments. So instead of carrying around a tube of water that was 33.9 feet high, or a tube of mercury that was 29.92 inches tall, and having to worry about all the spillage and distance, we started using our compound gauge. What we have is anything above zero PSI is pressure, PSI gauge. But anything below zero PSI is measuring below atmospheric pressure. It's still pressure, but we end up with less air pressure. And so if we see, if we look really close in the very bottom side of this, in the green it says N, and that stands for inches. And then it has HG. And on the periodic table of elements, HG represents mercury. And then it says VAC for vacuum. 
So what that's telling us is where this needle is pointing, it's measuring so many inches of mercury as if it was in a tube of mercury. So we're able to read or measure our vacuum in inches of mercury, inches of HG. Even though that was so very, very long ago, we could measure that. But the problem is in 29.92 inches of mercury, we could see that very easily in a tube. So if we see on our gauge, it goes up to 30. It's really impossible for us to actually get to 30. It only goes 29.92 inches. But imagine trying to read how close of a vacuum you have by just these little numbers. It's highly inaccurate and it's almost impossible to see if we have enough of a vacuum. You'll hear people say, oh yeah, pull it down to 30. Well, if you're at 30, it's actually not gonna be accurate because it's impossible. So trying to read 29.92 and 30 is very difficult. Actually, trying to read 20 inches is very difficult. It's very difficult to see how much of a vacuum you're actually in. So using the compound gauge with an analog pressure reading is highly inaccurate for us to read a vacuum. However, it's more convenient than carrying around a tube of mercury or a very long tube of water. There is a much, much better way. So we're gonna be using a vacuum gauge, also called a micron gauge. This micron gauge is going to pull down and give us a much more accurate reading so we know where a vacuum is at. For example, at atmospheric pressure, it's at 14.7 PSIA at sea level under standard conditions. But if we had that in feet of water, it'd be zero feet of water or zero inches of mercury. See here, we're at zero inches of mercury. And if we read microns, this one's not reading atmospheric pressure. It doesn't go that high. If it did, it'd be reading 760,000 microns at sea level. So 14.7 PSIA, zero feet of water, zero inches of mercury, and 76,000 microns all read the exact same thing. Now if I had a perfect vacuum, that would be zero PSI atmospheric pressure. That'd be 33.9 feet of water high. It'd be the same thing as 29.92 inches of mercury high or zero microns left that we could pull down to. So if we're trying to look at our compound gauge and we're trying to see the difference between 29.92 and say only 29, it's almost impossible or it is impossible to see that. Even if this gauge is perfectly calibrated, the thickness of that needle alone is gonna be wider than one inch of mercury. So it's almost impossible for us to see that. Now in one inch of mercury, there are 25,400 microns. So assuming that this gauge was perfectly calibrated, assuming that you could see the thickness of that needle, would you be able to see 25,400 hundredths of an inch? Wow, that's amazing. That's a very small number. Most HVAC equipment recommends pulling down to at least 500 microns of vacuum and mercury. Well, you cannot see on this gauge set where 500 microns is. There's no way possible. That's why we're not gonna be using this compound gauge set for pulling vacuum. We're gonna be using our much more accurate micron gauge or vacuum gauge to make sure that happens because we need to see exactly where we're at. Some other equipment's requiring you to pull down to 250 or even 100 microns. And it's absolutely impossible to see that on these manifold gauge sets. 25,400 microns in one inch. Let's compare this another way. Let's say we're doing cabinet work. Would you be using a yardstick to build cabinetry? Absolutely not. You'd be using a tape measure that has feet and inches. Inches is much smaller measurement than reading yards. Well, trying to pull a vacuum, here we have a yardstick, and we need to be below 500 microns to even be able to read that. So it's absolutely impossible for us to know if we're getting a good vacuum by reading our manifold gauge set with our compound gauge. We just simply cannot see that number. So we're gonna need a tool or an instrument that's much more accurate in reading that. You're gonna hear two people talk about these new micron gauges, but microns have been around for a very long time. What made them new was the fact that they were digital. And the digital micron gauges, I think it was in the late 1990s, maybe the early 2000s, where the digitals became very popular. But my first micron gauge set was this right here. And it was a micron gauge and it used a thermistor. And we actually had to zero it out and let it warm up. And we had these little adapters that we used. This is what we would screw into our unit or a recovery tank. And then we would take this little plug, we'd plug it in, we'd power the system up, 
and then we'd be able to read our vacuums. We had to adjust it with temperature because it was a thermistor style vacuum gauge, but it read in microns, and that was what was important. So people talk about these microns being new. Well, the digital ones are being new, but that's still, even if you figure it's in, a, in 2000, that's quite a while ago. And then even before that, microns are still around. We just had the thermistor micron gauges. So microns have been around for a very long time. It's just a much finer, a much smaller, way of reading distance or length, or in this case, vacuum. Instead of there being one inch of mercury we're reading, we're having a much finer number so we can see the microns. It's able for us to fine tune and see exactly where we're at for our vacuum. Stay tuned to the next video. We're talking about dehydration and why being able to read that proper vacuum is important.